Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bill Barabal, president of the Richard Nixon Foundation, and I want to thank you for joining us here this morning to mark the 25th anniversary of the passing of Pat Nixon and to celebrate her memory and her great legacy. First, I'd like to welcome the U.S. Naval Corps Sea Cadets from Colonel Lewis L. Millet Division, who will present the colors and support as side boys. And to those seated, would you please stand at this moment? for the National Anthem. say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glow The bombs bursting in air Gave proof through the night That a flag was still there Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave O'er the land of the free and the Wasn't that beautiful? Thank you, Alexandra Rupp, for that beautiful rendition of a national anthem. And thank you to the Sea Cadet Honor Guard. Please be seated. Now offering today's prayer is Yorba Linda Council Member Tom Lindsay. Our Father who art in heaven, we bow our heads at this moment in appreciation for the opportunity we have to be here today on this beautiful Yorba Linda day and honor this lady who loved Yorba Linda and who served her country so beautifully. We're grateful for the blessings that we have in this wonderful country in which we live. We're grateful for the freedom that we enjoy the liberty to be here today and enjoy this time together. We thank thee for 
this institution and this monument to these two people, President Nixon and his beloved wife, Pat. And we take a few moments this day to honor her and remember her on this anniversary. May we enjoy thy spirit particularly this day, Father. And may it remind us of things patriotic as well as things spiritual and help us to be better people in our own lives, to serve others and be available for those who might need us, as she did. Once again, we express our gratitude for all of our many blessings and pray a blessing upon our beautiful country that through all of its strife and trials that the good will prevail, that evil will be thwarted in its many forms, and that our lives will be full. These things we humbly pray for and thank thee for. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Count. Thank you, Councilman Lindsay and Alexandra. I'd like to take a few minutes to recognize some special guests who are with us today. Throughout her life, Pat Nixon devoted herself to causes in which she most deeply believed, presented with quite a platform as the wife of a prominent congressman and senator, later second lady of the United States for eight years, and then first lady for nearly six years. Few women in America, American life had more of a platform and an opportunity for influence than Pat Nixon. And in typical fashion, she threw all of her energy and passions into bettering the lives of people. So today, we are privileged to have with us representatives from 10 national organizations that Mrs. Nixon actively chaired, cared about, was personally involved with, and lent her name to. The organizations include the American Cancer Society, the American Heart Association, the American Red Cross, Boys and Girls Clubs of Central Orange Coast, Crittenton Services for Children and Families, the Girl Scouts, the Salvation Army, Town and Gown of the University of Southern California, and the Tournament of Roses in Pasadena. So please join me in welcoming them to the Nixon Library. And we very much look forward to working with each of these organizations in the coming months to celebrate Mrs. Nixon as next year is the 50th anniversary of her becoming First Lady of our land. It's now my pleasure to introduce my government counterpart here at the Nixon Library. Mike Elsey is director of the Nixon Presidential Library, which is part of the official system of the National Archives and Records Administration. Mike? On behalf of the Archivist of the United States, good morning and welcome to the Nixon Presidential Library. As Bill said, I'm Mike Elsey. I'm privileged to serve as the director of the Nixon Library. As the director of the library and an officer of the National Archives, I'm responsible for overseeing the program to preserve and protect and to make available to the public and to you folks the lifelong records of Richard Nixon. On this site, within these walls, we are holding 46 million textual records, 500,000 photographs, more than 5,000 hours each of audio and video recordings and 3,500 hours of film. Included in our holdings are the records in the collection of Pat Nixon in service to the administration of Dwight Eisenhower for eight years in the 1950s, Mrs. Nixon inarguably defined the role of an energetic and effective second lady wife to President, Vice President Nixon, who managed a demanding profile. As Vice President during the Eisenhower administration, even more consequential was the role Mrs. Nixon pioneered as First Lady during her, first, during her husband's presidential campaign and administration beginning 50 years ago this year. Perhaps most importantly, Pat Nixon was Mrs. Nixon, a decades-long partner to one of the most consequential political leaders of the 20th century. She stood by his side, and I'm honored as we celebrate her memory today. So it's a privilege to honor Mrs. Nixon today, and I'm looking forward to today's activities. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill Barabalt now. Bill? 
Thank you, Mike. We're here this morning to mark the 25th anniversary of the passing of Patricia Ryan Nixon. She led a remarkable life, a life that embodied and exemplified the American dream, a life that continues to edify and inspire everyone who knows or learns about it. As a young woman, she was curious and adventurous and incredibly disciplined. She had adult responsibilities thrust upon her at an early age. She put off her own education so she could work to put her two brothers through USC. And then she graduated later, cum laude, with the equivalent of a master's degree in education. She was an avid campaigner and canny strategist in 1946 and 48, when her young husband ran for the House of Representatives from right here in the 12th Congressional District. And then again in 1950, when they campaigned together for the U.S. Senate, driving up and down California in a 1949 yellow Mercury Woody station wagon. As the vice president's wife from 1953 to 1961, Pat Nixon essentially created the modern role of the second lady of the United States. She pioneered a unique and demanding schedule independent of the vice presidents, focusing on children and schools and the lives of ordinary men and women and families. She showed compassion by visiting a leper colony in Panama, and she showed bravery under a life-threatening attack in Caracas. When Karen Pence was here at the library this March, she accurately referred to her predecessor, Pat Nixon, as a second lady of many firsts. And Pat Nixon was also a first lady of many firsts. She was the first first lady to address the parliament of a foreign nation the first first lady to enter an active combat zone. She did more than any other first lady before or since to acquire historic antiques and artifacts for the White House. She had the first ramps installed for disabled visitors and instituted the first White House tours for the blind. She traveled the country tirelessly in support of volunteerism and volunteer projects. She was the first first lady to wear pants in public. And she was the first and only First Lady ever to issue a Thanksgiving proclamation. When Pat Nixon passed away, she was surrounded by her family. That was fitting, because her family meant everything to her. Over the course of her 81 years, she was a devoted daughter and sister, a loving wife and mother, and a grandmother. We're delighted and honored to have Pat Nixon's grandson, Christopher Nixon Cox, here this morning to talk about his grandmother and to lay a wreath at her memorial. Christopher, along with his mother, Tricia Nixon Cox, is a member of the Nixon Foundation's board. He is a magna cum laude graduate of Princeton University and of the New York University, New York University School of Law. He was the New York State Manager for John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign and ran on his own for Congress in 2010. Chris is the co-founder of an international consulting firm, OC Global Partners, and when you call or email him, he is as likely to be in Dubai or Shanghai as he is in Chicago or at home in New York. This I know is a fact. <laughs> After his remarks, Chris will lay a wreath at his grandmother's memorial. And at that time, Alexander Rupp will sing a very special song. It's a song that Chris's grandfather, Richard Nixon, often used to serenade his grandmother and accompanying himself on the piano at small private parties or as in 1974 on national television when he sang it to her on her birthday on the stage of the Grand Old Opry. <laughs> Many of you will know it, My Wild Irish Rose. Now please welcome Christopher Nixon Cox. Thank you, Bill, for that uh, wonderful introduction and the uh, wonderful tribute uh, to my grandmother. Uh, today, of course, is a very emotional day for me and my family, and uh, I remember very well 25 years ago in about 12 hours, uh, the moment of my grandmother's passing. And uh, it was early in the morning, and my grandfather came in for her last moments. Uh, he was awoken from his sleep and came in to be with her in her last moments. And I remember um, in the very final seconds, he expressed his deep love for my grandmother. And then just after she passed, he said, see you again. They both were people of faith. 
they both had faith that they would meet again. And that was very comforting to me in that time. But even beyond those final moments, the last several weeks of my grandmother's life, and I was 14 at the time, so I can remember it very well, were very special to me. Um, many of you may not have known my grandmother personally, but she was a very strong woman, a very moral woman, a very good woman. She would never brag and never complain. The last few weeks of her life were full of tremendous physical pain, but she took great love, great knowledge uh, in that she was surrounded by the love of her family. And she took those final few weeks and opened up a little bit about her life. So this is something that uh, she didn't talk about her childhood that much, but uh, in those final few weeks, uh, she did. And she talked about how her family grew up maybe without too much money, but with so much love of her parents. She talked about how during a, a good day, a good week, uh, if her father had made a little extra money, he would buy her a little strawberry ice cream cone. And if she got that, she knew it was, it was a good week for the family. But if she didn't get it, she wouldn't complain that she didn't have it. She still felt the love of her family, and that was really what was important. But as she talked about her life, I was struck by what an adventurer my grandmother was. And I thought about the time she was born, 1912, in California, in, a, in, a, in Nevada, and she moved to California about a year later. That was when the West was still almost a frontier. You could still feel like you could walk around the corner and walk into a local hardware store and maybe you'd see an Indian, a Native American, maybe you'd see some, something like that, something from the Old West. It still had that pioneer spirit. That was the California that my grandmother grew up in. And she was an adventurer. She loved to travel, even though she couldn't travel for the first several decades of her life. But when she got the chance to leave California, there was an aunt and uncle back in Connecticut who knew of a couple that needed to be driven across the country. And I have to tell you a little story about this. Back in those pioneer days, you actually didn't need a driver's license to drive. <laughs> so my grandmother, when she was, this is when she was 12, a few years before that time, she actually had become tall enough to reach the pedals. So that's what qualified to be able to drive a car. So she started driving a car from the age of 12. So by the time she was in her 20s, she was an expert driver. So her aunt and uncle felt very comfortable recommending her to this family to drive them uh, back across the country uh, from, uh, from California to Connecticut in their car. And uh, she took on the responsibility. And the trials of that drive, this was not the era of the Eisenhower superhighways. And this, this, was the, this was the era of single lane dirt roads and mountain, dangerous mountain passes. And my grandmother had to deal with uh, fixing flat tires and overheating radiators. And she was able to figure out and do it all on her own. And remember, this is a woman in the late 1920s, early 1930s in America. This was an, this was an incredible, incredible time for her to be setting off alone with a strange couple uh, going back to New York. And... Um, and when she, got to, when she got to Connecticut and got to the New York area, she fell in love with it. Uh, she, she had wonderful experiences in New York. That was when she got some opportunities to act uh, and uh, opportunities to work uh, in a hospital. And this really inspired her life. So in those final weeks, she talked about these experiences. And I thought, boy, she really was a pioneer in so many different ways. And when you look and see the different organizations that are here today, whether it's the American Cancer Association uh, or USC. And you think of my grandmother, of course, her mother died very young of liver cancer. So cancer was important to her. Well, what was a major accomplishment of the Nixon administration? It was funding the war on cancer. So much of that was due to my grandmother's experiences. Why do I bring up USC? Well, before my grandfather's presidency, we did not have Title IX. That meant that there wasn't equal funding for women's sports and men's sports, for graduate studies for women as there were for men. This was something that my grandmother helped pioneer. And of course, what I couldn't uh, let pass, I, I, I must say this as well, my grandmother and my grandfather were a team. They loved each other so much. I was thinking about what I'd say if I flew out on the plane this morning from New York. And I was thinking about what to say, and I, I, I thought of Six Crises, my grandfather's book, his first book he wrote. And it's interesting, if you read the dedication, he dedicates it to my grandmother. He says, for Pat, she also ran. 
he considered them a team. They were inseparable. And of course, the world didn't realize, because they were both very stoic people, they, 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 they didn't talk about uh, personal things as much in, in the open as, as certainly as we do nowadays. And when people saw how emotional my grandfather was just a few yards from here at my grandmother's services, people could see the true love between these two tremendous, incredible people. Of course, we had seen that ourselves because we, I grew up with my grandparents. I saw how much they loved each other. I saw how much they cared for each other. But it was great that in that moment, the world could see how much they loved each other. And I think that when we think it through history, it will be one of the great love stories, one of the great partnerships, and one of the great friendships that the world will ever see. And I look forward to the day when historians will talk about this. And I think that that will be one of the great legacies of, of my grandfather and my grandmother and, and their journey together. So I thank you all for being here today. It means so much uh, for me and for my family uh, to be surrounded by so many people who care so much for my grandmother and her legacy, my grandfather, of course, and his legacy. And uh, I hope that you enjoy the library today. And I'm so happy to be able to share this very important day, a meaningful day to me and to my family with all of you here today. So thank you very much for being here. If you listen, I'll sing you a sweet little song of a flower that's now dropped and dead. She is dearer to me, yes, than all of her mates, though each holds aloft its proud head. Twas given to me by a girl that I know since we met faith i've had no repose she is dearer by far yes than all of the stars and i call her my wild irish rose my wild irish rose the sweetest flower that grows you can search everywhere, but none can compare with my sweet Irish rose. My wild Irish rose, the dearest flower that grows. And some day for my sake, she may let me take the bloom of my world Irish Rose I'll ask now that our sea cadets retire.
ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our memorial program this morning. I invite all of you here today to take a walk through the Nixon Library's beautiful gar museum in the Pat Nixon Gardens on this important day in our nation's history. I think you'll find that there is a lot about the Nixons that many people just do not know. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.